thing and spread education. So um, I'm going to now introduce Fernando Salguero. Very good. <laughs> I won't be needing this. <laughs> uh, more light, though, would be wonderful. <laughs> okay, you're working the lights. So, um, let's see. We're going to be we're going to be covering a lot of ground tonight, okay? So, what I'm going to do is just get a feel for who is in the room uh, with me. First off, raise your hand if you have a copy of the um, you actually have printed a copy of uh, what we're going to be covering tonight. Good. All right. Now, Steve, you said that uh, this was accessible via smartphones. Uh, somehow for these Mom, people as well, is that right? Or not? Mom, <laughs> we have a microphone stealer. Yeah, it's accessible. We sent it out through the email, um, and I can also mail people that as well. I'm gonna see if I can find the link as well. So anyone with uh, anyone with email access right now, excuse me. Whoop. Anyone with email access right now should be able to, with your smartphone if you have one, access all the information. Good. All right. So, we have a lot of ground to cover. Forgive me if I seem a little curt. I'm gonna ask everyone to go ahead and silence your cell phones now. That would be wonderful. Where's the information? Okay, and I know that there are, uh, that at some uh, considerable expense to themselves, um, Steve and Jackie and Jane have printed out copies to put on these tables. At least, it looks like one for every table out there. Um, uh, and also, I want to point out that Steve and Jackie and Jane are spending $150 every single time to meet here. So they are putting out a lot of, not just money, but a lot goes into this. Time, effort, talking with the other, uh, talking with the guest speakers, lining this stuff up. There's a lot that goes into organizing. And one of the way, the best ways to keep a good, le good leadership from burning out is to do everything that you can to support them. Whether it's make a donation financially to help support what you're taking part in, um, or getting involved and helping take some of the, the burdens of leadership off of their shoulders. Okay, now, quick show of hands. Who here is a member of Survive and Thrive? Good, good, okay. So, who here has been to more than three Survive and Thrive meetups? Sweet. Okay, and Ken Fitchner, I see you back there. You're a pillar in this room. Thank you. Okay, so, Survive and Thrive, Philadelphia.org. It is completely free. It is open and accessible to everyone. We never deal with politics or anything metaphysical without, uh, with the exception of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Everything else is based on a very pragmatic, five sense, three dimensional reality of what it takes to be alive. Now, one of the things we always start with at Survive and Thrive is the power of the mind. It always has been and always will be what is between your ears that actually determines whether or not you, uh, you are able to negotiate a bad situation. Now, one of the things we do is never get too bogged down in, um, in any one particular mindset. We keep our minds wide open. We try extra hard to not be too um, sure of ourselves with respect to what issues may occur. So one thing that I would recommend to everyone here is whatever your parameters are now, actively think. Shake yourself up. Dig into a broader reality around you, okay? I think that if I were to ask for a show of hands, 
who thinks that Obama being in the White House is bad for this country, there would be a lot of folks, right? Who thinks, okay, quick show of hands, who thinks our financial system, our Federal Reserve system, is unsustainable? All right, okay. So these are threats that we're aware of, and we come together, and we like to be with like-minded people, but shake yourselves out of your comfort zone. Now, one of the things you know that I think is very respectable about this particular group is the fo uh, function uh, um, focus on natural law and the concept of sovereignty, the concept of self-ownership, the fact that you own yourself and that your body is your property, and essentially, whether it's natural law or, or man-made law, all law is some kind of property law. From gravity to uh, the right to self-defense, it's all somehow related to stuff. Thinking of yourself, your own body as your property is important. Now, most of us don't go around thinking about things on a molecular level. We don't wake up in our bodies every morning and think, oh, I'm a collection of about 50 to 70 trillion living cells. And I'm actually a string of DNA that keeps building new cells and shedding old cells. So I'm a collection of cells constantly flowing. Most of us don't think of ourselves that way, and yet, this is what we are. It's important to be mindful of your DNA and your ownership of your DNA. Your, 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 uh, whether it's from, a, from a, a, a political point or also just the ability to keep your heart beating so that you can live to love another day. So, survival psychology. Let's start with getting rid of the word can't, okay? There are a lot of folks. Um, there is one beautiful example of, of who and what we, we're, we're here to serve, um, Cindy Colangelo, who has been to a number of these meetings, I think. Is that right? Cindy, yes? Yes, okay. So, so Cindy is a prime example of who we really work to serve at Survive and Thrive. We have over 900 different members and we're a skill sharing collective. So what I cover here tonight is just, just glazing over the top of these different subjects. Every subject that we hit has a tremendous depth. Cindy came to the meetup knowing that she had to do for herself on a deeper level uh, she didn't feel particularly secure in her, in her life as far as her living situation, her neighborhood. And, but she was also very hesitant uh, with relation to the concept of guns. But with time and exposure and constantly asking, she has shaken herself out of her comfort zone. She and I, uh, well, she's been with uh, many uh, different Survival Thrive meetups where we go to the range to teach folks that have never dealt with firearms. She's eventually, and I'm just going to out you here, she's eventually come to be a firearms owner and just recently obtained her license to carry a firearm. Let me turn this down. I'm not ready for this. Just turn that off for right now. Okay, so couple of things you have to bear in mind. The concept of can't. Whatever your excuse is, for example, I, I can't afford to buy a shotgun, but I have a data package on my smartphone. Yeah, so wherever there is a will, there is a way. Okay? Um, the, the idea that um, also that we are grid dependent right now in this society. Now, when people think of the grid, they may think of different things. So I'm going to clarify how we work with the concept of the grid. The grid is all energy and delivery systems. That would be electricity, store-bought food, heating fuel, gasoline, potable water, smartphone, cell phone connections, landline phones, trucks and trains that transport goods to stores and their consumers as well as police, fire, and EMTs ready to help you deal with emergencies. That is the grid. And right now, almost everyone here is completely grid dependent. And that's probably why most of you are here, because you're aware of that to one degree or another. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, the concept of a survivor versus the concept of a prepper. A prepper is someone who stockpiles in good times, times of plenty, for when there are times of want. Okay, so there's the classic example of the, uh, the ant and the grasshopper, Aesop's Fable. Have you ever heard that before? Okay, so uh, the concept of just stockpiling what you need to make it through a bad situation for a while. Now, survivor, a survivalist mentality is very different. And that is, uh, a survivor, while they may also be a prepper, a survivor is someone who is able to, um, to use what is at hand and has the skill set inside, has, has the training already to make do, to go out into the woods and I know what to eat, I know how to make fire. If I'm put out of my house, I know how to clean water. So the concept of a prepper versus a survivalist is something that you may want to seriously consider for yourselves. How prepared do you want to be? Now, concept of refugees. Uh, refugees uh, are people that uh, are homeless and cannot do for themselves or their loved ones. All right. Now, we've seen refugees in movies, uh, in documentaries from all of human history. And... Uh, Today, we live in a culture where the zombie apocalypse is so popular, whether it's The Walking Dead or Xbox games or whatever the latest movie is, the concept of zombies and uh, zombie killing, zombie hunting is prevalent. A lot more prevalent than I think a lot of folks here would want to admit. And the reality is that that concept is dehumanizing other human beings the unprepared, folks that can't do well for themselves on the best of days. And when things crumble, they will be the first to thirst to death and starve to death and, and, and suffer the worst. And so this concept of zombie hunting or zombie apocalypse is something that should be watched and, in my mind, guarded against. Because dehumanizing people is very dangerous and has always led to catastrophe. Now, the concept of a predator, okay, for the rest of this uh, presentation, a predator is referred to, um, and it is an entity, not necessarily an individual person. Some folks here would consider different aspects of our government predator or predatory. A predator is an entity that will abduct, abuse, criminally attack, forcibly violate, plunder, and then kill, and for Cordelia, maybe consume. Uh, she has a thing about uh, cannibalism. Not a thing. I don't like it. It's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll can, uh, and, and we'll basically take over a weaker entity. All right? Now, the inhumane and merciless nature Inhumane and merciless nature is something that we should all truly come to understand. Okay, Most of us would stop to help our neighbors. Most of us would stop to help someone that we saw fall down on the street. Most of us here, because we are inherently good. However, there are a lot of people out there that are not. At the very least, they're sociopathic. That means they have no emotional attachment to other people or society as a whole. So we all know that terrible things happen when the grid is up. And if the grid goes down, the lights go off, it's only going to get worse. If you take a look at a case, if you study human nature in the, in the face of natural disasters, earthquakes in Haiti, tsunamis in Thailand and, and, and elsewhere, uh, oftentimes sexual predators will flock to those areas just after a collapse because it's easier to get things done in the dark that you don't want seen in the light. That's very important. And for those of us who are good in our hearts, for those of us who are good in our hearts, um, a lot of this is a foreign concept, things that we would never do. However, we must steel ourselves against that. And the best way to do it is to study the negative aspects of the human mind. One of the best ways that anyone could do that 
is watch on it's on ane.com for free the show I Survive. And what this does, the show I Survive, they're all close-up interviews with folks who have survived horrendous situations, whether they be natural disasters, car accidents, where they had to claw their way out to civilization, whether they were attacked by animals, or predator, human predators of all sorts. If we, if we study these people, we are in a much better position, and it will help to harden our hearts where we are currently soft. It is the killer instinct that must be harnessed if you are to perform to protect your family or yourself at the moment of truth. You must find the, the, the source of aggression. And that comes to our next part. What, if anything, are you willing to fight and then separately die and then separately kill for? What, if anything, some of us, some of us would just not want to have conflict and just, just go their way in peace. And some of us would be willing to stick up for uh, ourselves, but maybe not so much others. And some of us have families that are, take the priority above all other things. So ask yourself these questions. Get clear with it now, because the time to get clear with whether or not you are willing to execute lethal force is not in the moment, but it is now. What, if anything, are you willing to fight and kill for? Okay, so, that was pleasant. <laughs> okay, now I don't want to spend too much more time on psychology because we have a lot of a lot of other stuff to cover for homeostasis. Now, the concept of fight, flight, or freeze. Every one of us has all of them in us, but one is primary. Fight or flight or freeze. So obviously the concept of, of fighting is what we just discussed. The ability to run away if you can. That is uh, what, most, uh, what, most governing, uh, what most government agencies would have you do run away, de-escalate, de uh, that's oftentimes a, a way to get away. The other concept of freeze, which is to do nothing, don't move, stay still, do what you are told. This is important, and this is the biggest killer, okay? In all human tragedies, it's always been freezing that kills the most people. So, for example, Oftentimes, I'm a, uh, uh, excuse me, I, I've given you none of my credentials. I'm a firefighter since the year 2002. Uh, aside from hazmat training specialty, I also uh, am focused in on um, uh, technical rescue for vehicles. So the fact is that a lot of people die in their seat belts while their car is consumed in fire because they, uh, they freeze, they panic. They, it's, oh my gosh. What do I do? Uh, and then it's just a little too late. So bear that in mind. Another excellent example of freezing as a society is um, the Jews, pre-World War II. The fact is that they kept waiting for humanity, either the humanity of the National Socialist Party, the Nazis, or they were waiting for the humanity of other countries to intervene in what was happening, the ghettoing. First there were two big ghettos, and then there was just one small ghetto, and then came the cattle cars. And these people were ushered into, uh, into uh, gas chambers uh, with the, the tiny thread of hope. And that's what all, all predators use, uh, whether it's um, do what I say and I'll let you go, Take me to the ATM. Okay, take me to another ATM. Oh, now just give me this. Now just drive over there. Whether it's that level of predator or whether it's whether it's the Nazis coming through. It's okay. You're going to a work camp. Get on the get on the train. It's okay. You're going into showers. You're going to shower. Everything's going to be okay. This is what predators do, and all of human history is there for you. A lot of us feel very distant from that because we live in a peaceful society that is relatively uh, prosperous. But it is, uh, it's our folly if we forget the savage nature of humanity. 
Pay attention to current events. Stay very mindful of your physical surroundings. Stay on your toes. Keep your head on a swivel. Survival is not just about if some asteroid comes through or if a Mayan prophecy comes around. Oh wait, that's already gone. <laughs> it's not about then, it's about now. Maintaining your homeostasis now. One of the reasons I open carry 80% of the time that I'm outside of my own home is because I'm acutely aware. I listen to a police scanner on a regular basis. I pay attention to all of the different issues that are going on around us. If we were to all listen to a police scanner right now, we'd be shocked with the number of overdoses, assaults, um, uh, 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 robberies just happening on a constant basis, never make, uh, never make it in front of our faces, but it's going on. All right, and I think just to wrap up psychology, okay. The concept of stealth is very important with survival, all right? For me to open carry is actually to violate that principle, not be so stealthy. I'm sure that there are more, I know that there are more than a few concealed carriers in this room right now. No show of hands, please. The concept of stealth, that is light and sound and smell discipline. Controlling the amount of perception from other people. Now, there are different ways to think of stealth. Okay, the concept of, or the uh, the uh, ancient tradition of ninjutsu has a tremendous amount of very high quality um, uh, philosophy and art to and science to concealing one's movements, one's sounds, and one's smells. Um, so a few simple things. If you have to use a flashlight, where's a flashlight? Demo flashlight, okay. So if you have to use a flashlight, instead of just being all out in the open with it, right, um, go ahead and put your fingers over and have a little more control over how much light you emit, okay? Be mindful of where other people's field of vision would be if you, were, if you were across the street or in windows across the street up looking down, be very mindful and be very, very um, thrifty with your use of light. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Also, if you find yourself at some point when the grocery stores have been empty for a couple of weeks at this point, um, utilities are teetering, gas is almost already gone from all of the gas, uh, gas stations, then um, frying bacon on a little stove that you made in your living room? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Okay? Okay? Seriously, how many people here have gone one solid 24-hour period without ever eating food? Now, three days. Who here has gone three days? A couple of fasters. Okay. okay. Now, the, the general rule for survival for most adult human beings in most situations is three minutes with no air, three days with no water, three weeks with no food. Three weeks. Now they say, I wouldn't know myself, but they say, after a week or so, you're not quite as hungry. But the fact is that people lose their flipping minds. They lose their higher levels of consciousness and the deeper levels of base reptilian or animal savage nature come through. And the reality is, in this world, as pretty as it may look sometimes, there is still only the quick and the dead. And the idea that um, the idea that you are sloppy with your, uh, your secrecy, your ability to stay quiet, stay hidden, um, can, can, uh, can really come into play here. Also, if you have firearms, the use of silencers and flash suppressors. You can make silencers and flash suppressors or if you wanted to go through the feds, you could get yourself registered and get one uh, that's on the books. Okay, camouflage. The concept of disguising 
something so that it blends in with its surroundings, okay? Now, um, I don't own any camouflage clothing myself, but uh, the, the idea of wearing darker clothing or the idea of um, concealing things within your home so that they're just not seen as far as food and other important supplies go. Now, another concept here with relation to protecting what you have is subterfuge. Has anyone ever heard the word subterfuge? Quick show of hands. Subterfuge, okay, not all that many. So subterfuge is making others think one thing when the truth is another. A ruse, a red herring. Um, so one example, one example of using subterfuge if a big strong man who is very capable of defending himself uh, doesn't want to be engaged, use of subterfuge maybe would be wearing a long dumpy coat even though he's carrying, maybe walking with his shoulders down, maybe looking like he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. And what he does is he reduces himself in the perception of others. He's having a level of perception control over the, 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 the minds of others. Okay, now, one of the biggest things, with, and this is just to wrap up psychology, and this is going to be an exercise for everyone in this room, except the very youngest, the one who's wandering around. This time will come. Having the ability to control your own neurology the electrical and chemical signals that move through your brain and in fact control your body. Sometimes people freeze up, we talked about that. But even in other different kinds of stress, the, um, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of panic in situations. So uh, someone, uh, if, there's a, uh, if someone has a gun in their house and they keep it in a particular place and there's the sound of intruders downstairs, they're fumbling, they're, uh, they're, they're trying to get, oh my gosh, maybe they actually keep their ammo separate from their firearm. Lord forbid. Lock it in the safe. Lock it in the safe. <laughs> Uh, then there's a lot of anxiety, oh, and that can cloud judgment, that can kill the wrong people, that can do a lot of things or get you killed. Now there's a technique that we're all going to practice here. Hi, Chad. Hey, Fernando, how's it going? Sorry. Um, there's a, there's a, a, something called box breathing. Now here's why I'm bringing this up. It will actually alkalize your bloodstream. <coughs> It will alkalize your bloodstream, it will oxygenate your brain, and it will give a very real uh, chemical response in your body that will be calm and, 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 and there will be clarity. Now, box breathing is used by everyone from um, uh, first responders working to, uh, working to work through trauma in the moment. Um, it is used by a lot of snipers and special forces, and this is nothing new. It's also used in many forms of yoga for the same reasons. It gives you a level of clarity. All right, now box breathing. Breathe in through your nose. Don't do it now. Just listen first, and we're all going to do it together. Breathe in through your nose and fill your lungs in four counts. One, two, three, four. Hold your diaphragm, that's the muscle that expands your lungs. Don't hold your breath by your throat. <clears throat> no, hold it down here. It's important, it actually matters. <laughs> and then breathe out completely through your mouth. Imagine you are, when you're inhaling, your lungs are like a glass filling with water. Okay, in for four counts, hold it for four counts, and then from the top, you start steadily pressing and empty your lungs completely of air and hold for four counts. Okay? Now, I really appreciate it, and it's also going to help all of your neurology to establish better memories of this entire, this entire night. Your memories will actually be stronger in your brain if you participate with this action. Okay, so let's do a box breathing. We'll do uh, we'll do three rounds. Okay, just three. 
Okay? <coughs> okay. So, in through our nose for four counts. felt a warm sensation moving through our body. Uh, right now, a lot of us are feeling um, not quite lightheaded, but, but copacetic. Copacetic. Now, this is a very real technique that you can use anytime. If you feel you're about to lose your temper, if you feel that you are in a life or death situation and you feel yourself slipping into panic, just stop. Who's that talking over there? Would, excuse me, would you mind just, would you mind just taking the conversation? Oh, okay, would you mind just taking the conversation sure. a little bit away? Thank you so much. Okay, box breathing. Now, I'm gonna wrap up psychology here. We're gonna get into some of the nuts and bolts. Does anyone have any questions specifically related to the topic that we've just covered? Psy uh, survival psychology. Any questions? No? Okay. I will make myself Here's available. My... Yes? I'm talking about the freeze. Uh, I don't know if you can freeze. Is there any place or anybody that can tell you how to not freeze? I had that happen to me once where in a situation I did, I froze. Mm -hmm. And I just would like to make my own or for anybody else that might like to know how, how you can avoid going <coughs> that freeze. Well, the freeze actually kicks in because your, your, your body, your body, your mind is actually going into some state of shock, okay? And that's, that is different. Your, your body has its own intelligence, okay? Now, if, if, if it is, you know, no, I can stop this, then you may well stop that. If it's, whoa, this is too big, but I can get away, well, that's kept our DNA going for a long time. But the freezing is actually when it's too much, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to... And people say that I literally couldn't move. I couldn't pick up my keys. I couldn't undo my seatbelt. That box breathing right there, that right there. Even if it's just take a one deep breath, a woosa. Even if it's just one deep breath, but that box breathing is the best way to combat that level of anxiety. Good question. Any other psychological questions? Yes, ma'am. All right, I have a question. All right, using a firearm. So I'm living alone, okay? And I'm without my vision. Now, I should have a firearm, but I don't know how I would ever use one. Understood. Unless and I, 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 would, I would say it would even be maybe irresponsible. It could be someone coming to help you. Sure. That's what's going to have to happen. Now. Right. So I think that that would be a discussion for a different day, not necessarily what, what uh, would we, we would effectively cover here. But I, um, I would be very happy to, uh, to hang out with you and, and help you work through solutions. Good. Thank you. And there are some things in here. Okay. Now we're going to move on to section two, security and self-defense. Like I said, you have to make your decision now, ahead of time, and uh, you can't falter. Now, in this, there's a lot more information than we have the ability to cover. I have to get out of here in 45 minutes. <laughs> so, here we go. You can create a safe room inside of your own home. Um, and use a lot, of the in, uh, a lot of the techniques that I'm going to show you here. Now, there's some things that you can do. Uh, I'm sorry, your name again, ma'am? Carol. Carol? Carol. Okay. Yeah. So, there are some things that can be done. 
uh, to create early warning signals, okay? Uh, in a grid down situation, there are a number of different things that we can do. Um, some of them are simply as installing now solar powered motion active floodlights. <coughs> solar power, so it's not on the grid. Another route to go would, make, uh, would be make uh, uh, sound makers with rat traps tied to, um, tied to fishing line. Now you can also add things on to the snap part that comes down on a rat trap. You can take a piece of a stick or something else loud uh, so that it creates a ruckus when, it, when in fact, when in fact uh, someone or something is intruding in your space when you don't want them there. Uh, let's see, broken bottles uh, cemented or caulked into exterior window sills. Uh, there are also a number of different trip wires that can be purchased online that will fire a different size round. So you could put a shotgun round. Let's say we would use a blank. Let's say. They are available. Okay, now. Door and window reinforcement. The fact is that a lot of us live in, in, a, in, a, in a decent space and there are, are folks who will have their, if, if welfare doesn't get delivered, if, as, quick show of hands, who's aware of the fact that the EBT cards in 17 states went down last week? Ah. Oh. Made it through the conservative website pretty well. <laughs> and they also had unlimited. Oh, that's right. And there, there were glitches and they went and looted. Yeah. So here's the thing. If in fact, if in fact the EBT cards stop working, uh, there will be hordes, hordes of people that, again, can't do for themselves in the best of times, let alone when the grid goes down. And uh, they're much closer to that predatory nature. They already live closer to crime than a lot of us who are relatively well insulated. Now, door reinforcement. This is probably the single most efficient way to take one door that you have, your, your, whatever, however many doors you want. Right now, in your homes, for the most part, you have, hey Samson, sit down and be quiet. I told you to pay attention. I told you there was going to be a test after, right? And I said there are consequences for good, be good answers and bad answers, wrong answers, right? Pay attention, boy. <laughs> All right. Door reinforcements. Right now, most of us have doors, whether they're made of a lighter wood, a heavier wood, or steel, most of us have doors that are in, in all likelihood, a wooden door frame. There is a tiny little part of metal that uh, sticks out in a deadbolt, okay? So if someone were to come and just give a good swift kick and put power behind it, or let's say it's a team of badge predators <laughs> with a door ramming rod okay the fact is that most of the doors in your homes right now would not withstand that kind of force okay those locks are there for polite criminals and mostly for your own mental and emotional support that's what they're there for Okay, you've got, you've got a small uh, couple of hinges and you've probably got one or two, maybe three locks. Maybe one of them is one of those chain locks. They pop so easily. So, here's where we're gonna get into a little bit of physics. This is important, okay? Distribution of kinetic energy. Trying to get, <laughs> trying to get you all back there. Um, distribution of kinetic energy. Now, right now, if someone comes and kicks the, uh, the hinges are going to hold, but the, the side that's designed to open will fly open. This is where we come in. This is a length of two by four. This is about three and a half feet long. It has been cut. I'm going to just kind of walk this one around a little bit. It has been cut at the top. 
with a, with a wide V cut. And at the bottom, it's also been cut on an angle, okay? Uh, more of a, a sharp angle like, like this. So you've ta I've taken the, uh, the edges off. Now, here's how it works. When the, um, when fan and feces have met, <laughs> you would take a length, maybe foot and a half, two feet long, of two by four. You would take the longest nails, six, or if you can go deeper, uh, seven or eight inch nails, if you can get your hands on them. And you will nail them in as many as you can, right? It doesn't have to be every inch, but you know, uh, for, for a board this size, I would say a minimum of four nails, ideally six. And what you would do is you would put this down on the floor and you would have it already measured so that, this is gonna, this is gonna be my door. Sorry, Darren, I'm out of your shot, bud. Okay, so this is on the floor. Here there is, here there is a doorknob, right here, okay? So this is on the floor. Bless you. You put this under the doorknob and then wedge it. That's why the cut on the, this end here, okay? There's actually gonna be more surface contact with this small board and, uh, and, and also with the floor itself. So it'll go into a little notch down the bottom. It, that is not necessary, but it really helps with the physics. So what you've done here is created something like this. You can, you can kick it into place and kick it out of place, but it should be snug. Now if this is snug, what's going to happen is when someone tries to kick that door in, um, all of the kinetic energy is not being absorbed and then uh, by, the, uh, by, by the lock. Uh, it's, it's actually being transmitted. If this is nice and tight, it's being transmitted down through this board, through this board, and then out through your floor. Think about that. Yes, think about that. Imagine, um, imagine how you can ground yourself from electricity. Imagine how if, if you're not grounded from electricity, you know, a little bit of electricity can, can come through you and hurt you. Um, if, if someone, if, if, if there's a grounding, then electricity will move on through. So that can make the difference whether you're the end point for all that energy or you're a conduit of that energy and it gets dispersed. This disperses the kinetic energy very, very efficiently. And this will, uh, let's see, um, let's, you should always assume that your assailants are numbered at least half a dozen, and you should always assume that they have U.S. military training. Not because they are or are not currently active U.S. military, but because the U.S. military trains a lot of people in a lot of uh, very aggressive skills. And, it's, and it's, it's a smart thing to not underestimate your opponents that you haven't even met yet. So always assume that they have U.S. military training. What if you have concrete? If you have concrete, then you would uh, pre-drill those holes, pre-drill these holes, and have them ready to go. That is the best route to, to go. And you can just keep those holes covered up with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a mat or what have you. Okay, if you have... It, with like a wood veneer on top of it, so... Whatever, however... No, I mean, it ha I mean our floor has a wood veneer on top of... On top of concrete. slab? Concrete, yeah. Yeah, so actually that would, be, that would be fantastic. So then you could go and get eight, eight you know, drill eight inch deep, um, or six inch deep holes, and then get eight inch long carriage bolts, and they would go straight down. Door reinforcement, where's my paper? Okay, window reinforcement. Oh, uh, one thing, 
There is another version of this. Uh, you can go to Home Depot for about $18. They have them made of steel and they have, uh, they have a rubber coated uh, hook on the top and a foot. And it's all one piece instead of this being two. This is probably more efficient, but it's also bigger and cumbersome. This, uh, this other one is, uh, you can use it all the time and people wouldn't look at you strange. What is that? <laughs> okay, now, reinforcement of windows. Keeping your windows from being broken is really important because we're going to cover nuclear, chemical, and biological realities. Also, the ability to keep your family warm and dry. Key. So, everything you can do to maintain a barrier, a thermal and a vapor barrier, okay? Keep heat in and keep water out. So, uh, duct tape the windows with a square around the, uh, the perimeter and then, um, and then an X straight through. I'm sure we've all seen folks preparing for hurricanes uh, doing that over the years. Also, consider having uh, pre-cut pieces of three, at least three quarter inch plywood and having, um, and, uh, having them all with pre-drilled holes and having them labeled. So I have, my house is ready to go into lockdown in relatively short order. Um, everything is very clear and clearly labeled and where I need it to be. Um, so I'm prepared for this ahead of time. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, we're all headed to hell in a handbasket, uh, you know, everything is sliding down quickly, uh, and then we're out running to Home Depot trying to get plywood and run power tools and try and make clean cuts. Not smart. Chance favors the prepared mind. Okay, there is another, there is another route to go aside from pre-cut, pre-drill. And that is to take pieces of two by, I'm sorry, um, say uh, four by eight or eight or, or, or four by four sheets of plywood with uh, two holes pre-drilled and then open your windows. Most of us have, most of us have those vinyl windows. Most people have windows they, they can open from the top and from the bottom. And if you put the plywood on the outside with threads, it's called all thread, it's like one long piece of screw. You can bolt them on the outside and then take a piece of wood across, take a piece of wood on the inside that also has pre-drilled holes. So the all thread comes through here, from the outside, piece of wood, all thread through, and then you have bolts on either side. And what you're doing is you're actually creating a pretty darn secure protection. Now, you can insulate from there as far as like uh, putting in some sort of, uh, you know, minimize the amount of exposure there is from cold and heat loss or, or heat, uh, wh whatever your situation is. But the point is, uh, that's another route to go, is having those pieces that will go over instead of being fit to go into a window sill, they can just go right up and they have a thick bar on the inside so they're almost impossible to pry out. Okay, now, firearms. We at Survive and Thrive teach on a very regular basis family-friendly firearms, uh, where, where kids uh, often as young as eight uh, come along with their, with their parents or grandparents, and um, we teach all of the basics. Now, I'm, I do not have time to cover all firearms here today. So, long guns, shotguns, if you don't have a gun, the very best thing that you can do is make an investment in a shotgun. A shotgun has the, um, the most versatility, most different kind of situations. They're, they're very, uh, very easy to use, very reliable, and they have a wide variety of ammunition. That's important. Whether you would use solid slugs or what's called buck shot or bird shot, there are a lot of details we don't have time to get into here today. But uh, they, all the strengths and weaknesses of different kinds of firearms are laid out in this document for you. With relation to firearms, um, there are a lot of different things, but this is important. The concept of cover versus concealment. 
Ken Fitchner. Ken, you still here? He left. He left? Okay. Um, it always happened. <laughs> That folks usually reach to shut it off. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> that was somebody's cell phone ring. Okay, so cover pr provides ballistic insulation. Cover, um, cover is something that will stop bullets, uh, or at least slow them down. That's what we mean when we talk about ballistic insulation. Now, concealment is just hiding. Now right now, this would probably give some level of cover and concealment. I think my belly sticks out a little. Okay? Um, simply hiding out of sight is, is great. It's a, and it, it, it's a great way to not get shot. Um, however, a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about what provides cover. Um, so, refrigerators. Floors and ceilings, party walls. They're the walls uh, in houses or in between houses that don't have cinder block between them. They're not firewalls, but they're party walls. They're made of plaster or drywall and usually wood. Okay? Party walls, doors, car doors, none of these provide good cover. Okay, most rounds, with exception of the smallest, lightest loads for firearms, most rounds will pierce everything that I just mentioned. Car doors again and again and again. Um, the key to stopping a bullet is spreading its kinetic energy out far and wide and fast. So if you're going to um, if you're going to create some level of ballistic insulation, whether it's um, uh, uh, up against uh, windows or doors, or um, you're, you've created a safe room, a safe zone, what you want to do for ballistic insulation is stagger densities. So dirt and rocks, but um, uh, try to have them mixed together, okay? Just dirt alone won't do a whole lot. Just rocks alone may, but it's, it's also di more difficult to deal with. If you have sandbags of staggered uh, dirt and rocks together, uh, that's going to go a long way. Also, you can use uh, sandbags, paper, uh, and plastic bags or pillowcases filled with rocks and dirt. Uh, layers of three-quarter inch plywood and one or two inch thick metal. Um, that will stop a wider, much wider range of rounds, except the more powerful rifles. Um, encyclopedias, phone books, magazines bound up in duct tape, nice and tight. Um, always set it up so that the bullet will go through the flat side of a book as opposed to stacks of books this way because the, the bullet may actually encounter less resistance coming this way. It'll have to go through all these different layers of paper, and that will literally dissipate a lot more kinetic energy that way. Also, furniture such as dresser, dressers, buffets, file cabinets that get packed to the gills with books, metal objects like barbells, um, cast iron pans. These are things that are in our homes all the time. And sometimes what you're going to need, especially if you're creating a safe room in your house, whether it's in your basement or it's your bedroom, you may want to just create a legitimate space that creates cover, if, especially if you have the ability to return fire. Double thick walls of milk crates filled with canned food. And that actually serves a double purpose if, uh, you know, whatever doesn't get shot is edible. <laughs> now, if you can't have guns, oh, I hate that word. If you can't have guns, um, whether it's because of some entanglement uh, with the legal system or uh, for whatever reason, um, there are some um, options. Now, one of the best is right here. This is a can of wasp spray. 
It says it shoots for 27 feet, but it actually shoots for 18. <laughs> now, what this does is it delivers a very straight, very focused beam. Has anyone ever used a wasp and hornet spray before? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can stand way back here and get them. Okay? Now, this is where the role of compassion comes in for scrutiny. Because this is not mace. This will have all of the same effects of, of mace or pepper spray, or worse. And it will leave them, it can more permanently damage their mucous membranes and their eyes and their nose and their mouth if it gets in. It is most definitely much more toxic than pepper spray. Pepper spray is non-toxic, but a lot of criminals like to uh, shoot pepper spray like, 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 a, like, a, like a breath spray. Uh, it's just not very effective. This is something completely different. This costs you three dollars. No one would raise an eye if they saw it around your house, whether it's you know in, in, a, in a cabinet somewhere or what have you. This is perfectly legal, and uh, but not legal to use in the any way other than the instructions. So what I give to you is for um, educational purposes only. I'm not encouraging you to do anything. Okay, here's another one. Bug bombs. No crater. Those will work well with a lighter. I tried that, and I, that is not my experience. I've tried three different kinds, and I was not able to get them to flame efficiently. Find the ones that use propane or butane for a propeller. Okay. So bug bombs and foggers. Okay, for fleas and ticks and roaches and bed bugs, they sell six packs. Um, and essentially what you do, this is, this is not, this is actually a pepper spray, a, a pepper gas uh, in the same, in the same uh, basic mechanism. It's just one clip down, you just push it and it starts spewing. Now, if you are, let's say, upstairs in your home and you hear intruders come downstairs, a few bug bombs tossed down will go a long way because people will be gassed out. Okay? Now, if you combine that with um, a simple chemical spray mask, the kind that they sell at Home Depot. Hey Samson, remember when you would uh, remember when you would wear this mask? Right? Yeah. It's good to practice wearing the mask. You can be wearing just uh, a simple chemical respirator that you can buy for $50 from Home Depot and it will work against the bug spray. It will filter out the toxins, virtually everything. And you will be able to function well and give yourself an upper hand. You will be able to toss these bug bombs in the direction of people that you don't want near you and then, as they are reeling, as they're going through their fight, flight, or freeze in their minds, then, um, then that gives you uh, the ability to have an upper hand, whether it's lethal or otherwise. Another thing, gopher bombs. They are hydrogen cyanide in a little, um, in a little uh, it looks like a, a big firecracker. You can buy them in Agway and Tractor Supply Store for just a few dollars. Now they're designed to be thrown down gopher holes and poison them to death. The same principle can apply here, but because they are incendiary, because they actually start giving out some fire with the smoke, uh, it's, they're, they're, you should not use them inside the house. That's a huge benefit of using the uh, bug spray or the uh, foggers. Um, now. Pepper spray, generally speaking, the stuff that any civilian has access to is mostly a joke. Um, uh, police officers are conditioned to be pepper sprayed in the face and still have to go through and do what they do because it doesn't really stop you. And also, those little keychain maces, that, or they're not even maces, they're pepper sprays, this is a false sense of security, okay? Those little three-quarter ounce sprays on keychains have let more people down than are alive to speak about, about it. Fire extinguishers, same thing. 
You can use a fire extinguisher to take control. This releases, uh, it's, it's actually mostly a baking soda um, uh, that comes out very, very fine. And it gets all into your mucous membranes and you can't breathe. And uh, one of the reasons why this works to put fires out is it removes the oxygen uh, for, for a fire. So the fire can't breathe, and so neither would an assailant who is in a relatively closed-in space. Um, it's going to it's going to get into them, and it's also going to deprive them of some of their oxygen. Another way just to put your uh, put the odds in your favor, and that's really all that we can do is think and work ahead of time to stack the odds in our favor. Okay, moving in as a unit, traveling overwatch, bounding overwatch. I think this table would get a lot out of that. But I'm, I, I can't do that now. Uh, Empty-handed techniques. Well, we can't get into a lot of that right now either to be practical. What I will say is that you should always keep a distance between yourself and your predators. Or those who would be your predators. Always keep them at a distance. Okay, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people will carry a, a knife. Oh, well, I've got my knife. Yeah, guess what? Smacked ass. Because if they get close enough, if they want you or what you have, if they're determined, if they're jacked, and they're not thinking clearly, maybe they just got out of prison. They're experienced predators, and they move on you. By the time you get it out, if you even think you know what you're doing, it, it can be turned, taken from you, used against you, and that's often what happens in these situations. Again, study the behavior of predators. That show, um, I Survived, you can all watch it for free online. Okay, now, if you absolutely have nothing else, and you have to do, uh, you have to do physical combat with only your own neck, your body, nothing else. Um, an empty-handed strike. A lot of folks, when they punch, in fact, I was just talking to Samson about this the other day, because in our sunroom, we have a place where we do different kinds of training, right? He's getting very good at nunchucks. Um, so I'm teaching Samson and Savannah about different kinds of empty-handed strikes. Most people, when they punch, they end up punching incorrectly. They break or, or sprain their wrist, their fingers. Uh, this happens very, very, it's very, very common. Even for professional fighters, like MMA fighters, who, who do it all the time, they train for it, they live it, they breathe it, and they still break and sprain their hands and wrists. So, if you must do an empty-handed strike, consider using your, the, 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 uh, the the base of your palm, yes, the meat of your palm. Right down here, the heel, thank you, that's the word I was looking for, okay? Right there. Also, you will always have more physical strength, no matter where you are in life or, or, or with your physical power, you will always have more strength with whatever you use to hit that is closer to your core, the trunk of your body. So for example, your fingertips aren't a very effective way to hit. A uh, closed fist, more effective. What's called an ox jaw, or the back of your wrist, much more effective. Your elbow, you carry a lot more weight. Your shoulder, if you put your shoulder into something, you have more strength. And the same goes from your toes all the way up to, into your knees. You have more power the closer you are to your core, physically speaking. All right. Um, another thing, um, Okay, we'll work to keep this as uh, polite as possible. <sighs> Go for the savage part within yourself. Summon it up. The, uh, the fact is that everything you can do to resist a predator, um, uh, whether it, it be gouging of eyes, breaking of nose, um, if, you, if you somehow invade with a with a stick or a pen, the soft palate, right up in here, it's actually a way that um, the soft palate is not designed for, for pressure to come from up, okay? Uh, for, come upward. And so actually the soft palate is relatively easy to pierce. 
If you had, whether it's a kitchen knife or a, a strong rod of some sort, the soft palate in the top of the mouth is actually a pretty quick and simple way to get into the brain and s interrupt all those brain signals and they stop. Um, so, remember, eyes, throat, okay, and there's just no substitute. Uh, you know, a good swift kick in the ma male testicles will just drop any male. Uh, any, any male in here, would any male disagree with that? Show of hands. Hell no. <laughs> Every time it's ever happened to me, I've been out of control of my own body. I, it's just, I drop and I can't help myself. Um, and the reality is that, um, you know, even if even if there were males in here, which it would violate some guy code to, to kick another man there, uh, the fact is that if this is a life or death situation, if these are people who are coming to take what you have or what's important to you, then all bets are off because they lost their rights when they came in your door and violated yours. Does that make sense? Okay, another thing is boxing of the ear, creating air pressure on the ears. Cupping the ears, it's very easy, it doesn't take a lot of power, it's very easy to burst eardrums. And a burst eardrum, I haven't had one myself, but I have been around guns that have been fired too close without ear protection, and that's an incredibly painful thing. And so when people have their eardrums burst, has anyone here had their eardrum burst? You did? Do you remember when it happened? Mm -hmm. How did that feel to you? It still hurts. Okay. So simply cupping your hand and making air pressure go down into that hole in the side of the head. Okay? Savannah, don't do this while you're playing with your brother. <laughs> okay, now. Any questions specifically on self-defense? Questions? No? Time check. Turn this on. Okay. Heating options. Prepare for Pico to go out. Prepare for there to be no home heating fuel oil. Okay? Um, and there are a lot of folks out there who have kerosene heaters. They can be uh, smelly and dirty, but they can get you through temporarily. Uh, small wood stoves, like military stoves for camping, can be hooked into your basement if you go down to, uh, to the duct work that comes out of your water heater. Your water heater right now um, has a vent out of the top, and that carries carbon monoxide from the spent uh, probably natural gas or whatever it is you have, there, there's carbon monoxide most of the time from your water heaters. Um, so there'll be a vent that comes out. Uh, you can use that vent as a temporary chimney. Uh, so you can hook up a small camping stove in a basement where the heat would rise up through the structure, but, the, um, but, uh, uh, but a small fire, slow and steady, you can use that as a, uh, as a temporary chimney. Okay, now, I cannot stress this enough. Alcohol. Alcohol is the single best, most versatile fuel that you can ever, ever put your hands on. You can make alcohol yourself. And yes, you can do it for sipping, but um, it is also, it's also excellent for sterilization for cleaning, maintaining your own hygiene. Um, uh, it leaves no residue. So unlike uh, kerosene, if you spill kerosene, anytime anyone who's ever worked with a kerosene heater knows that they just stink all around. You can't, fill, you can't refuel them without having this petrochemical smell on you, around your house, everywhere. Okay, it's just a real pain. Alcohol is completely different. When you spill alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, you've spilled rubbing alcohol somewhere before, or you put it on your skin, it dries right up and there's no residue. It evaporates clean. And another huge uh, benefit is it comes in a lot of different forms. So, 180 proof grain alcohol that you can buy in a state store. 
It could be a bartering item. It could be good for fuel. It could be good for a lot of things. And a lot of vehicles can run off of alcohol. Grain liquor, right. Hand sanitizer. Most hand sanitizers are 99% alcohol with, with uh, just some gelling agent. Denatured alcohol. This is purchased uh, for $15 at the Home Depot, one gallon. Um, in the paint supply section. There are some others. You can use them for hurricane lamps and a lot of other things. Uh, let me show you here. This is important. All right. Again, I am a firefighter. Oh, with all of your uh, with all your fire extinguishers, if no one's ever taught you this. this. Is something that they teach us to teach others in the fire academy. It's called PASS. You should write it on all of your fire extinguishers. And PASS stands for pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. Okay. All fire extinguishers are going to have this pin that will easily pull. Okay. And then it's important that you aim at the fire. And then you've got this, you aim. It's always important. A lot of people have been failed by fire, have, have used fire extinguishers incorrectly because they'll be, let's say there's a big raging fire right here. Most people will go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And after 10 or 15 seconds, this is empty. But. The fire actually was burning from down here and rising. And so people focus in on the bulk of the flame when what they should be doing is focusing in on the source. Okay, so very important. And here's how you do it. Another thing is folks will just go like that and then the whole thing gets emptied without the fire being out. So it's important that you sweep. So pull aim, squeeze, and sweep. Now we're not going to need this anyway, but I just like to be prepared. Go figure. Seriously, if you write pass on all of your fire extinguishers, you may well save someone's life. <clears throat> okay. This is an alcohol stove. It is essentially a big can of sterno. Now, at the Home Depot, this is an unused one gallon paint can. Also at the Home Depot, this is an unused one quart paint can. On the inside, there is a roll of toilet paper with the cardboard removed. This is used as a wick. You take that, uh, you take that roll of toilet paper tight, tight, tight. The tighter it is in here, the better off it's all gonna be. And what you do is you twist it down and pack the whole thing in. Now, then you pour alcohol. Again, rubbing alcohol, denatured alcohol. Now, the can, the, the big can, is used as a carrying case and also for safety. It gives you more control. It's harder to knock over and all that. Um, what I will do is I, I'll pull it out so that you can see. Turn your table salt. Here. So one of the things they teach us in the fire academy is that um, alcohol fires are very difficult because they're very difficult to see. You can't see them if you've ever seen alcohol burn before. But a little bit of salt will actually uh, will actually make the flames orange. Can everyone see that? Okay. Now this is so so important. This creates zero carbon monoxide. If you're burning, if you're using candles, if you're using wood, if uh, there are a lot of other things that uh, uh, will kill you if you use them in a closed space. But alcohol is not one of them. Alcohol is not. Alcohol is clean, it's safe. Again, you can make your own if you so choose. It's easy to stockpile, it's inexpensive, it's around you all the time. <coughs> now, another thing is this, uh, this you can use to heat just one room. When you think about heating, remember this, the less space you have to heat, the more efficiently you'll be able to control it. You can insulate, you, one of the things you ought to bear in mind with insulating for cold is dead air space. Dead air space. 
because heat, a lot of heat gets lost through what's called conduction. Um, so uh, the reason why um, uh, deer don't freeze in the winter time is because all of their hair in their winter coats are hollow. If you take a piece of deer hide or fur and you just cut it open, you'll see it's like a small straw. And the same with bird feathers. That's why birds don't freeze to death and they're just such tiny little things and in the freezing cold. They're still out there foraging because they have dead air space. All right, I'll get to your water. I'll get there. How long does that last? Uh, this one right here uh, on a full, uh, full, it should go an hour and a half to two hours. But you don't have to let it burn for an hour and a half to two hours. If you're controlling your temperature in a small space, then you can just let it go for a while and then put it out. And guess what? There's no smoke. So, this is a lifesaver. This is something that every single human being in this room, with the exception of the children, have the ability, capacity to go out and make happen. And if you are still, seriously, if this, hmm, in the last five years that we've been doing Survive and Thrives, we do them once or twice a month for the last five years almost. Next month it'll be five years. Um, one of the things we really rail against is the idea of this being infotainment. Like a live YouTube video. Oh, this is curious. I'm curious about that. That's neat. I'm going to watch it. Oh, I saw this guy do that thing. I feel much better prepared now. No, you're not. Do it. Get physical. Make it happen. If, if, you, just, if you just squander every day that this grid is up, shame on you. And that's where really, you know, survival of the fittest definitely comes into play. Yes, ma'am. So normally you would burn that within the larger container? Oh, yes, ma'am. I would, oh, yeah. So I, that's that's, almost, what, I only took it out just so you could see it. Okay. And that's enough insulation from whatever surface? Oh, absolutely. That's not going to get hot to the touch. You can touch it. Um, you, can also, um, you can also put maybe a grid over, a, a grill over top of this and um, uh, use it to cook, use it to boil water, <coughs> which boiling water is really important. I'll get to that water in just a moment. Okay, alcohol. Okay, here I will show you this. In, uh, there are many different ways to build solar ovens. Okay, there are basic techniques. I don't have time to get into them tonight. We do teach this at our group. Um, but what it does is it harnesses the sun, the radiation of the sun. It has a black box and a clear airtight uh, lid. And what that does is it enables the sunlight to come in and create the greenhouse effect. Uh, that right there, um, between the hours of uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., will uh, reach uh, 450 degrees. Okay? Um, Savannah. What sort of things have we cooked in our sun oven? Just off the top of your head. Um, sometimes we'll cook uh, little pizzas. Little pizzas. We've cooked pizzas. Uh, bread, cornbread. There's a wide range of things that you can cook with a sun oven. Um, now, of course, you're dependent on there being a, a, a sunny day, but it is still a resource. Now, there are a lot of different kinds that you can make yourself. This one here is almost $300, uh, but it's also very efficient. Do, 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 do. Alcohol stoves. We teach folks how to make all different kinds of alcohol stoves. Don't have time for that. Okay. Any question about heating your space with the grid down? Question? Yes, sir. When you say you get a port cage, you roll toilet paper inside real tight. Yes, sir. What do we do? You pour the alcohol inside on the, on the toilet paper? Yes, sir. The, al um, the toilet paper operates as a wick. It's simply a placeholder for the alcohol. Okay. Now, those of you who don't know, it's never the thing that you think is burning that's actually on fire. They're actually superheated gases. So if it looks like wood is burning on a campfire, it's not. The fire is off of the wood, and it, the fire is actually consuming superheated gases. So you're not burning the wick here. You're actually burning... Uh, 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 Hot, hot fumes. Yes, sir. Did, did that wrap up your question, or? Yes, yeah, so in other words, the toilet paper becomes saturated with the alcohol. Well, alcohol 
you know, will start the evaporator on its own if you see it go. That's correct. But once, once you saturate the toilet paper, you light it, and it, and it burns for an hour and a half? Yeah, about that. Okay, great. Give or take. Well, you know, also, that depends on how tightly you roll your toilet paper. Yeah, how do you get it tight? How do you get it tight? Buy a big roll of toilet paper. Don't get the little dollar store rolls that are thin and whippy. Get like a big Scott roll, and um, you'll probably have to pry it in with a screwdriver. If you have to pry it in, if you have to force it in, that's going to be much better. If it's loose, it'll still work, but it will start to burn itself, as opposed to maintain the integrity of the wick long term. Thank you. Bob Fazio. If he might understand it <coughs> that I use fiberglass in mine. Oh. So it, so it doesn't actually, there's nothing burning. The fiberglass is burned. It's, 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 it's his theory of the gases. My fiberglass never burns. I, pack I would love to talk to you about that. That's yeah. news to me. Yes, sir. Have you ever tried compressing the toilet paper roll with an oil filter wrench? I have not. Okay. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Any other questions on heat? Yes, sir. The alcohol. How should I wait to put the alcohol in there? Like, have it ready? Like, will it just on its own? If oh, I no, I keep it stocked all the time. Okay. And, and that's another benefit to using the cans here. You can close it up. You can close it up. You can also put, a, uh, put this into a big Ziploc bag, and that'll be an, an even more effective thermal vapor uh, barrier. Uh, you can also store extra fuel. There's plenty of extra space in here. So you can empty out a water bottle, put alcohol in it, and just pack a couple of them in there. And so then you can actually have hours and hours. So this I always keep in my vehicles uh, during, excuse me, during the winter time. So uh, no matter what the situation is, sometimes we've just, uh, uh, Mike and Danielle, we've used these in social situations. You know, hey, I got a campfire ready to go. But, but um, okay. So moving along, we're going to move on to water. Time check. Oh, Fernando. I don't know. Oh, it's fine. You know what? Uh, we told Fernando eight forty-five. It's about eight forty-five. But you know, we do have the room till nine. Who wants to see Fernando speak for another fifteen minutes? Yeah, yeah. If that's okay with you, Fernando. Yeah, yeah. It's fine with me. I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty close, and I'm getting. I'm getting good, yeah, I can absolutely have this done in 15 minutes, and then I'll make myself available to folks. Uh, you can also always join our group uh, through uh, surviveandthrivephiladelphia.org. It's a meetup.com group. It is always free of charge, always free, always open to absolutely everyone. We are family focused, um, so it's not all testosterone type survival stuff. Okay, now we're going to talk about water. Okay, water only has one power. No matter what you see water doing, no matter what you use water for, it only ever does one thing. It's doing it right now. Water carries energy of many different kinds through physical space. That is to say, Water will move different kinds of energy, including matter, stuff, will move energy or things from one place to another place. That is all the water does. Now think about that. Does anybody know how much of the human body is made up of water? About 70%, give or take, right. Um, now the reason why our DNA uses water for every function that our DNA does no matter what it is, it's always using water. Now, your brain is 90% water because of its conductivity, okay? The ability to carry electrical and chemical signals so that you can see me now. You don't really see me, you see photons processed through your eyeballs. You don't really hear me, your, your eardrums are picking up waves from my vibrating larynx through the air. This is all through water. Now, Again, most folks can go about three days before they expire. Most situations, most people. There are exceptions. Now, different places to get water once the taps stop flowing. Um, water heaters. From the base, there's a, there's a drainage valve. You can drain water out and get it there. Swimming pools, puddles, uh, vegetable cans, urine, gray water. These are, these are type, um, these are things that water, 
These are different kinds of water that can be clarified and purified. Fill your bathtub, pots, and sinks during a pending emergency. If for any reason you expect the water to be turned off, fill your bathtub and uh, do that. Transpiration. This is another thing we do at Survive and Thrive is we have a lot of wilderness weekends. Uh, quick show of hands, who's been to a wilderness weekend? Kumbuja, Bofazio, Bill back there. Uh, there you go. You've been to quite a few. Okay, now, this is called transpiration. It won't work at this time of the year, but on deciduous trees, the trees that are right now turning color and losing leaves, when in the spring and summer and early fall, when there are leaves on the trees, you can put a plastic. My arm is a branch with a bunch of uh, a bunch of different twigs, as many as I can, as many leaves as I can get on a living tree in this bag. I will do it, and then make it tight right here. And what you're doing is you're creating a miniature greenhouse where the radiation of the sun will get the leaves so hot they begin to sweat. Now, sweating leaves will drip mostly pure H2O. It might taste a little woody, but the fact is that it's all clean, it's all natural, does not hurt the trees. You can put do a dozen or two of these, you can put a dozen or two of these on every, uh, on every tree. And you can put multiple trees out there, and then go out after it's uh, before uh, before you lose the light, and go out and harvest the water. And it won't every bag won't create a lot of water, but if you've got a dozen on this tree, a dozen on that tree, that's more than enough to sustain yourself. And what you're doing is actually working with the tree. The tree pulls the water from underground through its roots and is sharing it with you. So there is a natural harmony and a balance to this science. Does it have to be a clear bag or yes. just a black bag? It's best clear. Clear is always going to be best. And that also means that you can see the water clearly and you're not going to lose it. That, that, that's come in very handy. Okay, distillation. When you capture steam, okay, water is very special. Remember, it only carries things. That's what it does. But when water changes state of matter, it can go from, a, from, when it goes from a liquid to a gas, that's what I have going on right here, right now. When it goes from a liquid to a gas, water releases virtually everything that it was holding on to. Now right now, um, let's quick, quick show of hands, at home, who has well water? 20%, okay, so everybody else is on municipal water. Okay, most folks who live anywhere near this area, well, have you ever heard the term scoople punch? <laughs> <laughs> Municipalities filter their water to minimum specifications from the federal government. Those specifications are heavily influenced by industries. Um, there's a lot of sewage. There's number one cause of water pollution is human and animal feces. Second biggest cause of water pollution is household cleaners. Soap, detergent, lotion, shampoo, cleanser, conditioner. Um, and then there's pesticides and heavy metals and petroleum products and everything is in there. Everything is in there. Uh, a lot of your uh, Brita pitchers, faucet mounted filters, and uh, refrigerator filters at home only improve taste and odor. They don't actually remove anything of substance. It is play they are playing you to your senses and they are intentionally deceiving the American people. Now, distillation or reverse osmosis are uh, the most efficient way to remove all impurities. And while the grid is up, reverse osmosis is the best way to go. Even if you get a cheap one from Home Depot, a reverse osmosis system is the best way to go. Now, distillation. Essentially what you want to do is boil water. That means this is not an energy efficient way to do it. But if you can boil water, do so. And then what you do, here's a, this is metal, this is glass. What's happening is the steam is coming up. Let me turn this down, actually. I'm burning off more water than I need. Okay? The steam is going up. I'm going to turn this off. The steam is going up 
into the glass, and what's happening is condensation. Remember that from like first grade? There's condensation, uh, evaporation, precipitation, and it goes like that, right? So what happens here is by changing the state of matter, by going from liquid to gas, water releases most of what it's holding. All the stuff I just talked about is being released right now. And then the steam comes out, it touches the glass, um, metal or, or glass, uh, actually the bigger the better. I, I had to improvise this one. I didn't bring what I wanted to bring. Um, and then what happens is this is literally pure H2O. Um, insecticides, pesticides, um, uh, nuclear, nuclear uh, uh, radiation, radioactive particles, all of these things will be removed. All germs are dead. So, it's fantastic. And all you're doing is using physics, the, the simple science that has been provided for us. Okay, that's distillation. Excuse me, quick question. Yes. I was talking to someone that was, that was um, mentioning that drinking reverse osmosis water and distillate, uh, distilled water. Right, would uh, the, deplete no minerals. minerals. Yeah, that is incorrect. That is triple distilled water would do that. That's what they use in the pharmaceutical or chemical industries. Okay. Uh, you, do not, you do not ever use water for nutrition. You do not need, whenever someone says, oh, you need the minerals in the water. Well, then I ask them exactly what minerals are they? And no one ever has the answer. Okay. The fact is you need food for nutrition and water for hydration. There's a very big difference between those two functions. You do not need minerals in your water for your health. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, question, uh, Can you? is the same state of the water it, the, the stuff that you just boiled, or is that different than the water that you got from the steam? I don't understand your question. The, the boiled water, is that identical to the water that came out in the steam form? Or no, not? boiling water does not remove anything. Boiling water, if you, a lot of people have that misconception. If you boil water, you will cook living germs to be dead. You will cook them to death, but you will not remove them. They will still all be there. Yeah, the chemicals, all the residue, all the feces, the pharmaceutical residue. Let me tell you something. Everyone who takes any kind of medicine, hormones, steroids, birth control, antibiotics, antipsychotics, antidepressants, ADD medications, taken by tens of millions of children today, all those drugs are urinated out and they are flushed down where your sewage water is clean to minimum federal standards. The fact is that all drugs that have ever been on any pharmacy shelf have worked their way into the water supply. And none of the Brita filters, faucet mount filters, fridge filters will ever touch them. Uh, distillation will remove them. Will remove them. But boiling water still leaves them there. So you cook germs dead, that's important. All right, now, multi-stage filtration. I'm going to hustle through this one. Leatherman. Okay, now, multi-stage filtration. If you cannot distill your water, for whatever reason, this is second best. Okay, here's the multi-stage part. Take t-shirts, socks, cheesecloth, it doesn't matter. Um, you would want to use cotton as, 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 much, as much as you can. Uh, use natural fibers. Now, there is some science to this. Okay. Um, oh, I forgot to mention with water storage. Wait, did I hit storage yet? No. I didn't do water storage. Okay. Okay, deal. All right. Um, okay. Very important. You know how your intestines are all packed in like this and that? And, you know, if your intestines were all spread out, they'd go like 32 feet, right? But in your gut, they're all packed in and out, and they have all these curves. The reason for that, why, why we're designed that way, is so that our intestines have the most surface area contact with the food and other things that are moving through, so that they can pull from it more efficiently. Now, I'm going, the reason I'm bringing that up, it's important when doing multi-stage filtration. Take your cloth and pack it in like intestines. 
I'm going to start. I don't want to go too heavy down on the bottom. I don't want to pack it in so tightly that water won't flow. And I don't ever want to use paper towels for this. Uh, coffee filters, good. Paper towels, no good. Okay? So, multi-stage filtration. This is the start. And then from there, I'm going to take carbon. Now, you can get carbon from a variety of sources. Uh, um, uh, uh, water filter supply, you can get them online very inexpensively, big bags of black, black carbon. What it does is it absorbs chemicals, tastes, odors, and gases. Okay? You can get it from a, a, a fish tank supply store. And I'm going to stagger it. And then again, now this is important because if you have to walk down to the Schuylkill River because the, the taps are not flowing, if you have to pull water from a nearby creek close to your house, um, you need to remove as much of the solid matter as humanly possible because all the solid matter, little bits of leaves and sticks, will, are, 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 are huge floating apartment complexes for germs. <laughs> Lots of low-income housing for them to adhere to. And the fact is that once they get into your system, it's a rogue form of DNA, a different kind of bacteria that will come and try to take you over. All right? Now, um, every day on this planet, an average of 34,000 people, mostly babies and toddlers, die because they're drinking water with fecal coliform, with other different kinds of parasites in there, okay? Some of you may have done work with your church, may have uh, participated in fundraisers to get clean water for, for third world villages. Maybe you've heard some of this before. So, surface contact. The, the maximum amount, you see again, I keep kind of just twisting them up and then packing them in. So this is multi-stage. The idea of doing it this way is to remove as much of the solid particles as you possibly can. And then getting out as many of the chemicals. It doesn't have to look pretty. Um, this one here I can also just tape up and, and, and pack and take on the road. Right? So you can make your own. Now this is going to take a lot of stuff. But it's not going to take out everything. And one of the things you have to be mindful of is the role of germs. You must get rid of germs. Now there are two ways to do that for bacterial removal. One is chlorine bleach, another is iodine using chemicals. They're the two most common ways. Now, bleach. Hey Samson, we're almost done, bud. Keep it together, okay? Yes. But do me a favor, man. Just keep quiet, pay attention. We're almost done. Yeah, Bob. Real quick, could you use charcoal briquettes? No, never use charcoal briquettes. Okay. You can make your own charcoal by taking hard wood, like cherry, oak, walnut, etc. You can char that wood and break it up and you make your own carbon. But if you use charcoal briquettes, there are a lot of other chemicals that go into that process. Okay, now, on to killing germs. We gotta be out of here now. Um, on to killing germs. Bleach, okay? Bleach, if you buy a bottle of it and put it on the shelf for two years, it starts to lose its potency. If you, um, if you uh, take, this is, these are chlorine granules from a full supply store. These chlorine granules, one teaspoon into one gallon of water will make one gallon of bleach. Let that sink in. Because then one half teaspoon of bleach, and this is all in the, in the printout for you guys to, for the detail, one half teaspoon of bleach into one gallon of water, preferably run through multi-stage filtration, one half teaspoon of bleach will kill all of the germs inside of 30 minutes. Give it time to work. Always give bleach time to work. 30 minutes minimum. Um, and what you're going to do is have shelf-stable, a virtually unlimited supply of bleach. Whether you use it for, for cleaning and disinfecting or decontamination. Oh my 
gosh. <laughs> Boiling the water will kill all germs. Okay, um, reuse juice bottles. Reuse juice bottles, excellent. Soda bottles, excellent. If you have tap water, right now you're filtering your water, you're a little bit of a water snob like I am. Don't get hung up on it. Don't get hung up on it to, to the point where you don't store water. Every single one of these bottles that you throw in recycling is a wasted resource. Um, if you're using city tap water, you don't have to add any chlorine. They already make sure everything is dead. Um, okay. Seriously, stash as much water as you possibly can because that's one thing that most people overlook the most is, uh, is having water on hand. Now, does anyone have any questions on the subject of water? Back there, Ryan. What is the uh, average shelf life? Excellent question, there is none. And anyone who tells you that there is a shelf life for water should be slapped and sterilized. <laughs> okay, you put it in an airtight container and that's it. Now, it is best if you have less air. The less air that you have in that bottle, try to like overflow the bottle and then put the cap on. Okay, because that air is space for bacteria to grow. Keep it away from sunlight, keep it in a cool, dry space, and that bottle will last indefinitely. I will caution against buying one gallon milk jug type, the milk jug type of water, because they will leak after about a year. There's a 70% chance that they will spring a leak in a year to a year and a half. They will fail. Yes? Is there any other types of plastic that leach into the water that would be a problem? Okay, so good question. Um, there are a lot of mutagenic and carcinogenic substances that are in our soda bottles, water bottles right now. It's, it's in this, okay? Now, you will die in three days without water, okay? So that's one of those things I was talking about, like bottle tap water. I don't care if you always drink out of your bread, just, just bottle it. Just get it there. You have kidneys, you have livers. You can, you, your body is amazing in its ability to flush things out and fight things off. But the, but the mutagenic impact of drinking from plastic may or may not come out one or two or three decades from now. So short-term benefit, long-term gain, there, you know, weigh that stuff out. Yes, ma'am? They have a 55 gallon yes. food grade. Yeah, 55 gallon HDPE. Um, my grandazzo went in on a bulk purchase. We do bulk purchases at Survive and Thrive every now and again uh, because it's much more efficient and we can get good quality stuff. Um, but yes, 55 gallon drums. And they're a lot harder to move, but good Lord, I felt so much better when I had all mine filled up. Okay, yes ma'am? The, the uh, charcoal t-shirt thing that you made, yes, how much water is it safe to put through there? I would easily nice? run right through there, depending on how dirty the water is. Let's say the Schuylkill River in its current state, um, I would easily run 20 gallons through there. Um, but the, the other thing is, don't let these, if you use the filter, you can't come back to it after a, after a day or so, okay? You need a new filter, all right? So that's important. Uh, because otherwise the stuff in here will go stagnant because the microorganisms will grow. Yes, sir, back there. If you're filling water bottles for storage, does it make any difference if you use hot or cold water? Uh, yes, it does. It's better for you to use cold water, and that's because it will reduce the amount of breakdown and wear and tear on the plastic. So his concern is lessened by using cold water as opposed to hot water. Good questions. Any other questions on water? Water? Okay, I'm trying to wrap this up ASAP here. There's so much about food. We are having on the 27th of this month uh, a free session on um, uh, canning, drying, preserving food. Um, the old ways, we really try to keep the things alive. How to make jerk meat, how to, uh, how to, here, this is, um, this is, uh, this is a, uh, this is a boneless pork chop that it has been salted and then dried with what's called curing salt or pink salt. This is what you used to make uh, bacon. I mean, we can make you make your, make your own bacon with this. Um, now, what, what happens is salt is hypotonic. It won't allow water, living uh, water. Uh, it's a preservative. 
it's a preservative and it's a, it's astringent. It won't let germs grow. Now, uh, this is a pink salt or curing salt, and that is very important for preventing botulism. So it's not just about packing in salt. Packing in salt is great for all kinds of meats and fish and all that other stuff. I'm not going to get into all those details. What I will say is, okay, sprouting right here, right here. It can be as easy as take, you can sprout just about any kind of bean, lentil. You can sprout all kinds of seeds, broccoli, garlic, um, but the absolute best seed to sprout is alfalfa. Alfalfa, now right here, this is just a mason jar with the lid removed, it's still got the band on there. It's got a little bit of, you can use cloth, I'm using a little bit of screen, uh, nylon screen. And uh, I, I put a couple uh, teaspoons of seeds in here. Uh, I did this, this one here I did two days ago and it's sprouting well. Um, put water in, let it, let it sit for a minute and then dump it out and then just kind of roll it around. Now up here I have sprouting containers. <coughs> okay, these are five days old. This is five days of growth. Now, each one of these has about one teaspoon of seeds. Um, I think this is mostly alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa really is a superfood. Uh, you can live on just alfalfa and nothing else. You really can. Um, so what you're doing here is you're activating the life cycle. Not just eating seeds, and also you can do, like I said, you can do with beans, lima beans, pinto beans, all dried beans. You can, um, you can sprout. The, the stuff that's in your pantry right now, if you soak it in water for about a couple hours, and then drain the water off, and then soak it for a little, uh, maybe uh, five or ten minutes a day, but don't let it just be wet all the time. What you're doing is you're activating the life cycle. And that, now these, I don't know whoever can see this, and you can check it out on your way out. Um, these are, this is two or three days of growth right here. I think this is two days of growth. Um, what you're doing is, uh, these are, this one here, this is a, a combination of mung beans and broccoli and radishes and garlic. It's a zippy, mi zippy mix. Um, and these are great to do now. Live with it now. Put it in your sandwiches, your salads. They're good for you. It's good practice for you to have. You will then know what you like and what you don't like, what your family likes and doesn't like. And then you can have that because if you're prepared now, if you live more now, ready for the grid to go down, when the grid goes down, you're in a much better position while everyone else out there is scratching their heads. All right, we do have time for like a couple more questions. We got to cut it off. Today. Yeah, that's fine. I can no, be done fine. now, man. Whatever you need. All right, listen. Um, communication. Communication, forget about it. Honestly, there's no practical route. Um, there are so many different uh, difficulties, and then also there's the level of state control. Um, just in D.C. during a protest, um, uh, the, uh, there were many reports of cell phone jammers being used. Uh, this is the vets in D.C. Uh, gathering, at, you know. So there are a lot of people that have the ability. It's illegal to have cell phone jammers, just so you know. Uh, but then also they require power, the cell phone aspect of it. Uh, if you can't pick up, if you can't talk to your neighbor somehow, uh, if you can't talk to that family member, honestly, there's no practical way. You know, Cindy asked me about that probably three or four years ago, and I've been researching and looking for other options, and there really is none. About EMPs. Electromagnetic pulses uh, will fry most of our electronics. There are ways to prevent that. You can build a Faraday cage. All the stuff is online. It's also, our website, surviveandthrive.com, has a, just a tremendous library for you to download and print up or do whatever you want. Everything from how to, how to do everything. We teach uh, butchering of, uh, of, of birds or small animals or deer. We teach, we teach um, everything that has been forgotten by our society and then other new things like some of what you're seeing here. Now, unfortunately, I do not have time to get into 
hazmat, which is nuclear, chemical, biological. There are a lot of different differences in masks. You got a question here. Yes. <laughs> Do you have a question, boy? <laughs> what is it? Make it fast. No, it should go weaker. And that's why you should always aim for the bottom of the fire and sweep along the side to side. Good. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, fine. You know, I'm ready to wrap up now, Steve. So, but, okay. So, there's a lot going on with Fukushima. Uh, you can pick up a, a half-decent Geiger counter. If you're going to look for a radiation detector, uh, you should look for something that looks for ionizing radiation in gamma rays and beta particles. Gamma, beta. They're very important. I don't have time to tell you why they're important, but they are. Um, the, thing about, the thing about nuclear, chemical, and biological is that what you really want to do is treat all pollen, dust, any kind of smoke in the air as your mortal enemy. Okay? Drops of water, your mortal enemy. This is a Tyvek suit. It's a coverall. You can buy them, uh, you can get them online, or uh, let's see, 911 Supply down in Norristown has them, I think, for, I got this one there, I think, for $7. You can buy them for six, seven, eight dollars online. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is what they give out for hazmat situations. There's no magic to those folks walking around with Geiger counters. You've seen them on TV, right? With the click, 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 click. Okay? There's no magic to what they're wearing. All that it is is it's air and water tight. And then when they're done in their dirty, whatever dirty work they're doing, they come to what's called a decontamination space and they get washed down with soap and water. Soap grabs onto dirt, which includes all the radioactive particles, and then the water carries that dirt down, and it'll drop it down into, and they'll collect it or whatever. So there are ways, all the, the instructions for decontamination and insulating yourself from nuclear radiation is here. How to create safe space in your home, using your basement or whatever physical uh, space you have to work with, uh, it's all there online for you, and we will be teaching probably a nuclear class on the, um, on the 17th of November. So the 27th of October is food preservation, and the 17th of November is going to be nuke knowledge for love. <laughs> okay, the fact is that Syria and Iran and Russia and China all have a strategic alliance. They have a pact, a defense pact. And we were, I was very active in getting my networks of people, I do a lot of other things too, uh, getting my people to reach out to their lawmakers and say, if you move on Syria, we're going to riot, we're going to revolt, you, we will turn your life upside down. And I think maybe for the first time in modern history, the will of the people circumvented the war machine. Okay? At first, Obama was going, oh, we don't need the Congress. And then it's, well, maybe we'll run it through Congress. And then it's, well, maybe we'll talk to Iran. Okay? Here's the thing. The machine is still working for that kind of war. And there are intercontinental ballistic missiles pointed at all of us right now. They never went away. They never went away. And I don't blame Russia personally. I don't blame Russia. If, if I saw a neighbor kicking in all my neighbor's doors, and he's making his way around to mine, and I have a pact with my neighbors that I'm going to stick together if he comes on our side of the street, yeah, yeah. I, if this guy's got an, uh, an AR-15 going through house to house, taking, kicking in the doors, taking the stuff, claiming it as mine and his, and then, you know, if he's got an AR-15, I'm going to use my AK-47 when he steps over. So it's very important because a lot of folks think that inter uh, a nuclear war is something, oh God, I just, uh, let me put you under the bomb. Let me just be there. I don't want to live in that world. Well, guess what? A, you probably won't have much of a choice. B, it's not going to be as bad as you've been taught by, you've been conditioned by mass media. It will not be that bad. And um, uh, 
it is it is survivable. Most people that are going to die are not going to die from the initial explosion. Or if limerick goes, okay? <laughs> Anybody know what the radiation, the evacuation radiation around Fukushima was? Originally, it was set for 10 miles. Anybody know how far out they actually evacuated to? 50 miles. 50 miles. There are no human beings living, working, breathing within 50 miles without this kind of gear. Now, guess how far around the, uh, the uh, warning zone is for Limerick? 10 miles. 10 miles. Are we within 50 miles of Limerick right now? Yeah, we are. Right now, okay? So, if Limerick goes, it's not gonna be a big bang, it's gonna be a slow, steady leak of ionizing radiation that is invisible to us. And that's why if we treat all dust and pollen as our mortal enemy, if we create a safe room, we can clean our air, there's different ways to do that, I don't have time to get into it, but we can create a safe space. If we have to go out, we can be prepared for that. This, okay, really quickly, this is a NATO standard right here. What you're gonna find here, this is a NATO standard canister. Now, this is the bottom of the barrel, well no, bottom of the barrel for air, uh, uh, air um, cleaning is going to be the store-bought in um, Home Depot. Respirators, chemical respirators. They will work, they will work. Uh, but, they leave your eyes open. Now this is a civilian style um, uh, uh, Eastern, like uh, the Czechoslovakian, the uh, uh, old Russian style. Uh, this is Eastern European. Um, uh, and you can buy these in surplus uh, uh, places for $15, $20 if, if you find a good deal. Now, this is designed for military, okay? Again, it's protecting the eyes, but there are big differences. These eyes are out wide and to the side. These eyes are more focused for binocular vision that doesn't get interrupted so that you can shoot your rifle more efficiently. Also, this one has the, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, filter directly in the center. This one is designed to have the filter on the side so that you can more accurately operate a rifle. So, this one also has what's called a voice box. It will mimic your larynx so that you can more effectively communicate with your team members when you're wearing it. Now, this is the Czech style. These, uh, again, 15, 20 bucks. If they try to charge you more, slap them. <laughs> okay, now, very important. Israeli, they take care of their own. Now, when you shop for a gas mask, if you can get your hands on an Israeli gas mask, it's going to be a good one, especially if you see a Hebrew seal over top of it, okay, over the filter itself. This is important. It's, it's actually important. They put a prayer. They put a prayer here. Uh, they take it very seriously. Now, um, this, I'm not going to open it now, but this attaches right onto here. This is a civilian style gas mask. You can tell by the placement of the filter. Uh, this also has a huge advantage because... It has a port for drinking, and then here's the drinking tube. You can get a canteen, or you can just put the tube into a, into a bottle of water. So that makes a big difference so that you can hydrate yourself um, in, in this unfortunate event. Okay? Now. Cost of those. Say it again? Cost of those. Oh, Charlie. I, I love Charlie. Charlie, what did you get here, man? It took a while. Okay. Well, happy to have you. Cost of those, uh, let's see, um, let's see, at the last gun show uh, over in Oaks, they were $38 a piece with drinking straw, but not with the canteen attached. $38. The more of those you can stock up with, honestly, the better off you're going to be. Also, the Israelis make them for uh, uh, adult civilian, child civilian. Um, I have a, I, well, I don't need them now because my boy's big enough, but we've had... Uh, we, we have uh, plenty of uh, those for, for little kids. Bear that in mind. Uh, I think you had your hand up first? 
Yes, I just wanted to know, um, your upcoming sessions or meetings, are they listed on your website? They are, okay? Now, I will tell you, um, I've, I've constructed that meetup to be accessible to the least among us. Those who have the least amount of money, those who have the least amount of space, those who have the least amount of physical strength. And so because I put it to the least among us, I make it accessible by public transportation in a big urban center, which is Philadelphia. Okay, so uh, those of you who are willing to, to brave a, a trip into the city, um, you know, it's certainly not for everyone, okay, but that's where we do it, and we do it there because we can reach the most amount of people that way. Okay, who had the question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how long do those, uh, the, the gas filters last for? <laughs> Again, it depends on how thick the situation is. Um, but uh, these are designed to be, uh, you know, easily worn in and out of a space for you. You could use uh, you, you could use them for weeks. Oh, good. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, I mean, especially the Israelis. The Israelis. This stuff. This is. This, these are pumped out. Uh, these are pumped out in um, in, uh, in in big dirty factories. Uh, these these are these are very specifically designed to. Uh, to protect a civilian population from, from a, a very big threat. If anyone's ever seen a picture of Israel on a map and who, who they're surrounded by, who all want them out or dead, then you know that's the threat that they designed for. Okay, any other questions? All right, any other questions? We do gotta wrap it up because we're on the One in the back. Go, go, go. How, how do you know how long you should stay in your house and when you should stay? <coughs> okay, um, you should always plan for at least two weeks. Always plan to stay in your house for at least two weeks. The federal government used to recommend 72 hours. They now recommend two weeks. Yeah. Also a great resource. Be ready for two months. Okay, listen, seriously, folks, I've really enjoyed my time with you. I'm going to clean up. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm here. The group is there for you.